little intro about Edie. So she was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2013 at the age of 60. Edie is passionate about helping other people live well with Parkinson's. And she does this a lot of times when in person, when she's allowed to be in person, she does this at support groups and different groups around in her area. She's done this in Florida and Virginia. Right now she's doing more things online, though she will be doing something in person pretty soon, hopefully. Um, and she's, uh, her motto is, I love it, happy, um, may, oh, find their happy and then make it happen. Uh, so she's going to talk a lot about that today, about what she does to live well and all the actions that she takes. And hopefully by the end of this session, you're going to have some really, really uh, practical strategies that you can do every day uh, to help you live well. So thank you so much for being here, Edie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. So what was your life like before Parkinson's? What did you do? How did you spend your time? Well, um, I was a very active person. I stayed busy doing all sorts of things. Um, I started my career as a teacher. I, was, uh, I taught health and physical education. Uh, but after my children were born, I have two daughters. Um, I didn't go back to that because my heart really is with animal care. And so I went into the veterinary business. I worked as a veterinary assistant for almost 20 years. I ran a wildlife rescue center out of my home. So um, I really kind of focused on that. But even, uh, even though I did that, I've always been a teacher of something. You know, as I mentioned, the phys physical education. Um, for a number of years, I taught wildlife and environmental education in elementary schools as a visiting teacher. And for the past 46 years, I've made myself available as a Bible educator and taught classes in uh, nursing homes and private classes as well. So that's the kind of thing that kept me busy. Um, also, I love being outdoors. So I did lots of gardening um, and I was an avid scuba diver and I did kayaking. My husband and I like travel, so we've been to a number of places here in the States. I've been to Europe, we, um, Mexico a number of times, and we even spent two weeks in Africa. Nice. Um, and then of course there's family. Um, before my diagnosis, I already had two grandchildren. Now I have four, but I was a very busy, busy Nana and, um, you know, did all sorts of things with my both my children as well as my grandchildren. So life for me has always been about staying busy and you know doing things. Great. So when was the first time that you began to experience Parkinson's symptoms? And you know, how long did that take before you were officially diagnosed? What's, what was that diagnosis process like? The symptoms go way back to when I was in my mid thirties, but at the time I didn't know that that's what I was dealing with. I had what my doctors considered like mystery ailments. Um, I was constantly developing problems just on one side, the right side, it was always the right side. Um, there were issues with pain, there were um, complications with blood pressure, there were uh, feelings of heaviness on one side and that affected my um, my gait because my my legs didn't swing evenly. Um, there were just all kinds of things and at one point they thought I had lupus. They thought I had all kinds of issues that they couldn't prove physically so it always came back to well we think you're just under a lot of stress. So um, you know it was just a frustrating part of my life and then in my 40s, I, I lost most of my sense of smell. I, um, my handwriting was affected. My arm stopped swinging when I walked. And I developed a frozen shoulder for no apparent reason. And throughout those years, they always looked at my issues as being orthopedic problems because I'd always been active in high school and college, I was active in gymnastics and dance. And, you know, when you fall down a few too many times, you kind of cause some issues that you live with later. So they always looked at my problems orthopedically. And so they, you know, they, and they couldn't fix it. You know, when, when I got a frozen shoulder, um, it just took forever to get through that. 
Uh, then, of course, there's issues with constipation, which many of us deal with, but who would have thunk that, um, you know, that had something to do with a brain disease? So, you know, that all now makes sense now that I know what I'm dealing with. Um, and then before I get into the diagnosis part, I just wanted to mention that when I was um, 51, I believe it was, uh, no, wait a minute. I was 53 when I was diagnosed with um, breast cancer. And I often reflect, because people ask me what's so frustrating and difficult about Parkinson's. And my answer is, well, it's frustrating because you lose control, it's taken away from you, and you can't fix it. Whereas when I dealt with breast cancer, um, even though that was one of the most difficult things I've ever had to deal with, and it's a year of my life that I feel like I, I lost, and I'll, I won't get that back, but that's all right, I'm moving forward. Um, but when the doctor came in to tell me my diagnosis then, he sat down in front of me and he did something like, he went like this, he went, look at me. Um, I looked at him and he said, we can fix this. And I just sat straight up and I said, okay. So, and then we came up with a plan and it would, like I said, it was difficult and involved surgeries and chemotherapy and all sorts of things. And, you know, but I'm happy to say that nine and nine and a half years now uh, later, uh, I'm, I'm a survivor. Um, so I'm no stranger to tribulation or you know challenges with regards to my health which is really why when i do my presentation i refer to uh, stepping stones and stumbling blocks because when you're going down this road and you encounter these obstacles you can either decide well that's the end of the road and i'm going to stop or you can figure out how to get around those things and step over them and keep on going and that's what I did with, the, park, with the, uh, the breast cancer. And I try to apply that to Parkinson's um, as far as each little challenge that I face, because if you take it in small chunks, it's easier to manage than if you look at the big Parkinson's picture and say, wow, I don't think I can do that. So my very first Parkinson's symptom that I recognized was when I woke up from my last surgery, because I had reconstruction done, I woke up with a little twitch in my middle finger and it wouldn't stop ticking. And I thought, oh, this can't be good. And when I brought it to the attention of my, one of my doctors, they said, well, it's probably just localized damage from the chemotherapy because it had leaked into my arm a few times and you know, left me with some chemical burns. So we, she kind of said, well, let's wait and see if it goes away. Well, it didn't go away and it turned, it went from a tick in my finger to a twitch in my whole hand. And the reason I was concerned about Parkinson's is because one of my closest friends had Parkinson's and died with Parkinson's. And I kind of experienced a lot of the difficulties she went through. Uh, with her and I was at her bedside when she passed away and when I started having this twitch I thought oh please anything but Parkinson's please mm -hmm. don't be Parkinson's I even asked one of my doctors I said could this be Parkinson's and the answer was oh no and I and I was like oh, well how do you know you haven't done an examination he said oh well Parkinson's is when you shake on both sides he obviously hadn't done his homework. <laughs> uh, and he later, I taught him a lot of things. <laughs> but, you know, so it's frustrating when you try to figure out something, you're told, no, it can't be that, you know, even when you ask the direct question. So it became extremely frustrating because doctors don't always listen. They look at you and say, well, you're young and you're not overweight and you're pretty fit and you eat well and nah, it can't be that. Um, so sometimes you have to go outside the box and find somebody who's going to look at you for the first time and not already have an idea of what they think you have. Well, I was experiencing some joint pain um, from one of my cancer drugs. 
So they sent me to a rheumatologist and I never met the man before. And when he walked in, I was sitting on the table just as I am right now. And he walked in, he greeted me and he looked at my hand and he said, have you had a brain scan yet? I said, why would I have a brain scan? He said, well, you just survived breast cancer. And if it comes back, that's one of the places it could show up. So you obviously, he said, have a, um, an issue, uh, a neurological issue because you've got a, a twitch. Well, I, it, this is a year and a half from the time that I started with a little tick. And within three days, I not only had that, I'd had an MRI and I was seen by a, a, a neurologist. So he was the one who fast-tracked that because, you know, he had, a, it was a fresh set of eyes looking at my situation. So, um, you know, I, I was then diagnosed. But from the time the twitch started to the actual diagnosis was, an, was 19 months. Wow. So what made you go to the rheumatologist? Um, it was the joint, the joint. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then what do you, um, what do you think was happening with your, your previous doctors? You think they just had too much history with you? And yeah, I think that can be the problem sometimes. And I'm not saying that, for instance, the um, oncologist, she was, she had every right to, you know, not jump to conclusions and send me off to a neurologist right away because there was reason to believe that it could have been a localized problem. Mm -hmm. um, but as things kept progressing, mm -hmm. they were not thinking in terms of neurological issues because like I said, my medical history has often been uh, orthopedic. I've had shoulder surgery uh, three times. I've had thoracic outlet syndrome. I've had, you know, issues with, you know, orthopedic problems pretty much all my life. So. Uh, yeah, I think there was a little too much history and that caused some confusion um, mm -hmm. with diagnosis. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the, you had that experience with your oncologist and he said, uh, we're going to beat this. You're going to beat this. You're going to be fine. Right. What was the conversation like when you got the Parkinson's diagnosis? Well, the doctor, you know, it, the way it worked was um, he came in, he was very thorough. Uh, he spent an hour and a half with me uh, as far as, you know, his examination. When we were done, he looked at me, he put his hand on my arm and he just kind of looked at me and he said, you already know what we're dealing with, don't you? And I said, yes, I think so. And then a week later, he sent me a letter with his official diagnosis. So nowhere in that conversation was there any mention of, we can fix this. Mm -hmm. you know, it was just the opposite. I was told, this is not something we can fix, but we can manage it. So I had to settle for that. Great. So what was the first thing you did after you found out? What were the first changes that you made if there were changes? Well, the very first thing I did, I, I kept my composure in the doctor's office when he said, you know what we're dealing with. And I was okay for a few days. And then when I got the actual letter and I read on paper that I was diagnosed with right hemisphere Parkinson's disease, I cried. I didn't know what else to do. I was by myself. Unfortunately, my husband was away on business, so I was home alone. And one of my daughters happened to call right about then. And I found myself in a dark place wishing that I was dead. And I actually said a terrible thing. And I'm going to say this to all of you because I'm going to admit. I said to my daughter, I wish I had died of breast cancer than to have to live with Parkinson's. But I want you to understand that when you first get the diagnosis, those are the kinds of things that go through your head. Um, now, I'm gonna, you know, I wasn't ever suicidal, but you really do kind of think, oh, I, I can't, I can't live like this. And so I, you know, you can understand why some people, you know, aren't able to accept the diagnosis and, you know, bad things can happen. So. Anyway, that's what 
was that was my reaction, my initial reaction. As far as the changes, initially, the only thing I did was follow, I, I was compliant with my doctor's uh, suggestion about medications. And that's a difficult road, road in itself because everybody's um, protocol for medication is different and it's a trial and error kind of thing. You know, it's like, well, let's try this and see how it works. Well, that made me sick or that made me crazy or that gave me a compulsive disorder. You know, you have to kind of go through and, you know, try out all the options. And I'm happy to say we finally did find a combination of things that works really well for me. Um, so initially, that's the first thing I did and about the only thing I did. Um, as far as my journey to accepting the diagnosis, um, that was a long road. And the reason it was a long road is because I got sidetracked in my pity party. You know, when you talk about a railroad, you got the main line that goes from point A to point B and you get there the quickest way you can. You know, the sidetrack is a little dinky road that they, you know, have all the little local stops and it takes longer. And I'm happy to say I eventually got back on the main line as opposed to being on a spur that goes nowhere. <laughs> so I'm grateful for the fact that I found my way back, but I did that with help. I, I didn't do it by myself. Um, a friend of mine suggested that I uh, go to a support group. And like many, at first I was like, Ugh. I don't wanna go to a place where there's a lot of people who have difficulty walking and talking and maybe they're all, you know, I just wasn't sure if I could do that. But then I thought, well, nothing else seems to be working and I need some support. So I went and I'm grateful that I did because there were two people there that played a very important role in helping get me going in the direction I needed to go. One young man who had Parkinson's uh, gave a talk about uh, the importance of exercise. And that made me sit up and pay attention because, hey, I used to be a gym teacher. You know, I worked out all the time, but when I got the breast cancer, all of that sort of stopped because with the reconstructive surgeries, it takes a while to rehab through that. And uh, I was more guarding and protecting than working hard. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this friend of mine, his name was David. He was the one who said, hey, exercise is the key. He said, and you, it can even help you um, cut back on your medication if you work hard enough. And I thought, oh, I like that. The other thing I'm grateful for as far as David, um, he was the one who introduced me to the Davis Finney Foundation. So I'm very grateful because I'm part of a wonderful tribe of people who um, care about me and that I care about. Then there was a, a woman there that um, she gave me a little bit of tough love. One day I sat and I kind of did the whole whiny thing about uh, I've got Parkinson's and after she listened to all that she looked at me and she said all right she says I've had Parkinson's for eight years and I've learned to accept it and I'm moving on with my life and here's what I'm going to tell you she said these are the cards you've been dealt she said play your cards and then she said and play to win make it count, do something, come on, get, you know, get off your butt and stop feeling sorry for yourself is basically what she said. And so that's when I realized that I got to get going, I got to figure it out. And I'm happy to say that um, I did. Um, how much time did it take from that moment where you said, I, I don't want to be here, I wish I had died of breast cancer to the feeling of like, you know, you know what, I'm gonna take control, I'm gonna do something different. It was just a little over a year. Okay. During the course of that year, I still worked. I still did all the things I was supposed to do, but there was um, a feeling of emptiness, you know, and kind of just a lot of depression and sadness. But, you know, you can still go through life and go through the motions, but the meaning isn't there anymore. Yeah. A lot of the time we hear somebody says that they, they feel like they are, not looking forward to anything. Right. right. So it, it's kind of like, you know, we all like something to look forward to. We, whether it's a trip or a, you know, a job or a change or something. Right. And uh, if you can get stuck in that point that there's nothing, 
right. then it can be a long road. Well, I'm glad that you found those people. I think that, um, did you end up staying at that support group or was it? Yes, yeah. yes. I stayed there and I, I, I eventually became a board member um, with them because again, I found a group that appreciated my willingness to um, help with the educational process. And so um, I became very involved with, their, with that group, yeah. Um, do you look at your life with Parkinson's or have you experienced it as something that sort of stages and you, you know, the earlier stages weren't so bad and like you're moving through stages or, or have or those changes not been as dramatic? Well, when you talk about a um, chronic illness or disability, they do medically, they give you the different stages. And typically you go from good to bad to worse. In my case, with regards to Parkinson's, um, I kind of went from bad to worse right away and now better. So it's a little scrambled up. So I started off, the first stage was when um, I, I had issues with falling. I was um, slurring my speech. I had a lot of brain fog. I was having difficulty, you know, doing my job. And that's when I thought something's not right because I was usually right on and I didn't make a lot of silly mistakes and suddenly things weren't falling to place like they should. And that's when I, you know, found out I had the Parkinson's. And when I found out, I got worse as far as not physically, as far as my walking and that sort of thing. It was more the um, mental and emotional, you know, dealing with depression, dealing with apathy, being in a pity party. You know, it's a party of one and it's no fun. There's no prizes, there's no cake. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, but then when I found out what I needed to do to make my life better and to live well through uh, Parkinson's, you know, the educational process and I applied what I learned and then I was willing to work at it because this doesn't happen without some effort. You got to put a little sweat into it. And when I did, then the, my life got better as far as the physical aspects. So now I walk better, I talk better, and I think better. And that that's the really important part when your outlook on life changes for the better, uh, that, then the other things um, get better too. Great. So it sounds like you have a you know, sort of holistic approach to your care and to the things that you pay attention to in order to feel well, right? So what does wellness mean to you? If you, if you could share it with this group, uh, yeah. what, what are some things, you know, how do you define it? And then how, how do you help other people bring that into their life with Parkinson's? I think that in order to truly experience wellness, we have to, um, give consideration to more than just the physical, physical aspects of our life. And to be well, you have to find the balance between your physical, your mental, and your spiritual well-being or health. And you need to give all three of those um, you know, equal attention in order to flourish. Um, and they all require exercise and nutrition. So you can apply those two things to the three aspects, um, you know, of our health. Um, so I encourage people not to get too hung up on just the physical because that's what we see first. You know, we, we have issues with walking or we, the arm doesn't swing or, you know, we twitch or whatever, you know, so we obviously want to take care of those aspects of Parkinson's because that's what people see. But as far as what's in our hearts and in our minds, we also have to give consideration to um, making sure we are on the right road with that. Right. So what do you do? What are the actions that you take uh, physically, mentally, and spiritually? Well, with regards to the physical aspects of my life, um, exercise, okay. So I try to get out, I mean, and right now, I'm with the, all of you. It's really, really tough because there are limitations as to where we can go and what we can do. Even though our gyms have reopened, my doctor said, mm -mm, it's a germ factory. I don't want you going there. So 
you have to get a little more creative, but you can still, I, I walk, I swim, I do my water aerobics, um, I do gardening. Now somebody, I heard them say that it, uh, housework doesn't count, but I beg to differ because when I scrub my floors and do housework, I break a sweat and I was told if you sweat, it counts. <laughs> so, um, you know, those are the kinds of things I try to, you know, incorporate into my daily routine. As far as my mental exercise, um, I'm hooked on my, you know, my phone apps, you know, with playing cards, doing Scrabble, Sudoku, crossword puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, you know, anything to kind of focus on memory, you know, uh, uh, games or exercises and, you know, that sort of thing. So that's an exercise for the mind. As far as my spiritual exercise, that comes with being an active member of my congregation and sharing my faith with others when appropriate to do so. Um, now, as far as nourishing our bodies, obviously that includes eating a good diet, which, um, you know, I, I'll admit I love ice cream and I eat potato chips and I eat things I shouldn't eat, but for the most part, you have to have a good diet of, you know, fiber and lots of olive oil and, you know, nuts and things like that. So um, I'm not a dietitian, so I'm not going to tell people what to eat, but, you know, we, most of us know what the good diet is. <laughs> um, as far as nourishing the mind, um, I, I encourage people to do something creative. Um, find something that you enjoy making, whether you sew or paint or sculpt or whatever, or even growing flowers, things like that, poetry. Um, some people like to journal and, and write things down. Um, so I, I, you know, it's the creative process that feeds the mind. And I just want to take a second to show you what I like to do. Um, I live right by the beach. Um, my husband and I are hooked on um, collecting shark's teeth. I've got thousands of them and I thought one day, well, I wonder what I can do with them. And so I do, I hope you can see this. Oh, wow. I do Wait, shark teeth. Of... That is so cool. So I have that one and I have a little, and my favorites are the turtles because I do turtle patrol. So these are shark's teeth oh. and fossilized stones um, and bones that I that is so cool. My creative um, expression is sharks made into pictures. Tell, tell everyone about your turtle patrol. I love it. My turtle patrol. I have such a love for turtles. Um, that goes back from my scuba diving days when I've encountered them underwater and have swam with them. And it's just the most awesome thing. So when I moved here and heard that they did turtle patrol and, and they do it from April till the end of October. So it's a, a long season and you have to be willing to get up when it's still dark and you're on the beach before sunup because all the turtle activity is done at night. And then we come in very early in the morning before beachcomers, you know, get there. Um, and we check for turtle tracks. We check for new nests. And right now we're in the season uh, of the hatchings. So we look for little bitty turtle tracks um, to sit, you know, at the nest sites to make sure they all end up in the water. And if they don't all go in the right direction, you have to follow those tracks until you hopefully find them. And last year, one day we found 10 turtles that had gone in the wrong direction and uh, scooped them up in our little beach bucket, which we carry with us. <laughs> So do you do that every day? No, um, they have it set up where you basically do it once a week. Oh my gosh, that is. Somebody does it, you know, so it's yeah. done. Every, but I, I'm assigned to just one day a week. Oh, wow, that is pretty magical to see. It is. And tiny that's baby what, turtle. I know, they're like the size, they fit in the palm of your hand. Yeah. Um, and we found them occasionally where they get flipped over in the sand and they can't flip back over and that's the other reason we go really early in the morning before sun up because once the sun's up, if any of them are stranded like that, then not good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
that's a spe special yeah. thing. I think. Right. Um, let's see, we talked about, oh, so we talked about creativity for the mind. And then as far as um, spiritual enrichment, that would be reading inspirational writings and taking in that sort of um, nutrition. So the, those are things I'm able to do. Yeah. So what, what would you say have been, has been the most challenging part of having Parkinson's um, or maybe the most challenging symptom you've dealt with? And, and what are the ways that you manage those things? Like you had, you'd mentioned earlier that you had constipation and you're talking about, you know, eating a good diet. Have you been able to get that under control? And what are some other things that you've tried? Um, well, the most challenging thing that I've dealt with, and I think that people are, right now are maybe dealing with, are the um, issues with apathy and depression. Like I said, the outward symptoms are the ones that we try to get control of so that we aren't embarrassed when we're out in public, but the things that we feel inside, the brain fog or the um, feeling of not caring about anything, that, that there's nothing to wake up for in the morning, um, those are difficult to, to get past. Um, some people are just like, snap out of it. What's the problem? What's your problem? You know, but it's not that simple. So that's why, I, again, I go back to the balance of the three parts of our health. If you're not giving attention to all parts, something's being left out and that could create um, a hole somewhere, you know, where, um, you know, it's difficult to get motivated. So lack of motivation is what keeps us stuck in a rut, so to speak. Um, and getting out of that rut can be difficult. Yeah, um, constipation, eh, it's a constant battle, to be honest with you. And when I talk about it with my doctor, he's like, well, you know, drink more. He thinks I should be drinking olive oil. I'm like, okay, I'll just cook more with it. <laughs> uh, you know, and there obviously are physical things you can do to encourage, you know, good bowel health. But mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of thing where it's, um, it, you just deal with it and you do the best you can. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a workout junkie for years now. And it has made a huge difference in my ability to function. Um, it has allowed me to for a couple of years, I actually took half of my Parkinson's medication uh, and functioned quite well. Uh, now, like I said, I've, I'm seven and a half years into diagnosis and I haven't increased the original dose at all. I'm back to where I was when I started. Um, so I feel that that's, that helps me to appreciate that working hard and exercising, it can help in my case anyway, slow things down and make the medicine that we take more effective. Um, and, as long, and you have to understand that taking your medication and working out and exercising, they're both important, they're equally important. Um, and you've got to, you can't do one without the other and expect good results. So um, those are the things that are important to do. But right now, I think, you have to find something that will motivate you to get up and, and move because yeah. uh, with the situation that people are faced right now with this pandemic, um, we have a tendency to want to just stay home, stay isolated. And when you do that, you're not quite as likely to get out of your chair and move. So I know that you have developed a few ways to make sure that you stay accountable to the things that you want to do. Um, can you share with us like one of your processes and one of your sheets that you use to um, kind of make sure that you continue to track what you what goals you've set for yourself? Sure. And I have to give credit where credit is due because I didn't make this up. Um, I took a class a few years ago on how to live with a chronic illness and it was um, presented by the um, League of, uh, eight, let's see, what is it, the um, Office of Aging, that's what it was. So this was part of their curriculum and uh, it stuck with me because it really helps. Now, please excuse the fact that I am not doing a um, 
PowerPoint presentation. This is very basic and I'm going to show you <laughs> how I do things. Now, I don't know if we can, can you see yeah. that? Or uh, yeah. All right. So making an action plan is like, creating a strategy for um, reaching a goal, doing something that you need, that you want to do. So if you put it in writing, uh, it helps you be a little bit more accountable. And I also suggest that you do it either with your spouse or partner or even your support group. Because when I did this, we did it with a, a Parkinson's class that I taught and um, everybody, you know, did the program and each week we went over the results and it was really um, very beneficial. But if I can look at this backwards. All right, you start off by listing, well, put your name on it because that way you own it. Then you set your goal. Now, people are sometimes confused because a goal is the end result. What is it you want to accomplish? Um, sometimes people say, well, my goal is I want to exercise more, but exercise isn't a goal. It's a means to the end. So that goes in the next space. So um, in a second, I'll show you what an example of my goal was. Then you're going to talk about uh, what you're going to do to reach that goal, how you're going to do it. In other words, um, how much time are you going to spend on it? Um, that sort of thing. And then you can even put when, what days of the week are you going to do it? Uh, every day or just a few days? It's whatever you feel um, you can do. And then an important part of this uh, little form, you need to look at your plan and then say, hmm, can I do this? Have I set the bar too high? Have I set it too low? You know, so you have to kind of, I, I suggest you circle one of the numbers, the one being, oh, I'm not real sure I can do this at all. And five being, yeah, I'm absolutely sure. And then, you know, you leave room for a log because you want to kind of make note of how you're progressing through the process. So then, excuse me, let me take that off. Here's an example of my action plan. So I wanted to, can we see that? There. Yep. So I wanted to strengthen the muscles in my legs. So that's the end result I wanted. And to do that, I've developed a plan for walking. And I was going to walk 15 minutes a day, and I was going to do it three times a day. Well, I figured that's not setting the bar too high. And then to, as far as the when, I thought, well, we'll spread it out, and I'll do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. My level of confidence, I was sure I could do that. So I circled number three. And then I kept a log of days of the week, and then the three times a day that I'm supposed to do it. And as you can see, I did it twice on Monday, twice on Wednesday, and twice on Friday. So I had to admit, I didn't do my three times a week. So then if you're doing this with a group or a class, you go back to them and you say, well, here's my report for the week. You either did it or you didn't do it. And in my case, I didn't quite get there. So what I do is I say to them, I walked three days a week, but only twice a day. Then their question to me would be, well, why didn't you walk three times a day? And my honest answer is, it was boring and I wasn't really motivated to get up and do it. So then you open it up to the group and you say, what can this person do to be more successful as far as her plan? So some of the suggestions are change the plan, walk with a friend or walk a dog. So there are ways that you can analyze, make adjustments, and then you go back to your plan. So, and I, often, and I recommend that you stick with it for a couple of weeks because you may not be successful initially, but don't give up because if your end result is what you need and what you want, then you're just gonna have to learn to make the right, you know, the adjustments and apply yourself uh, and you'll be successful. So that's the action plan and uh, it's, pretty easy to, you know, to fill, fill that form.
<laughs> Great. Well, we'll um, we're gonna we'll create the templates that you shared here, and then we'll send them out in the recording for everyone, so that you can have the sheets. You can print them out if you want. Um, Kathy actually just said, "I love that you showed the action plan. I have facilitated that class in our agency on aging. It's great with a group. Yeah, excellent. So uh, we'll we'll make sure that you guys have that, and you can do it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the dog because you said walk the dog, and you have the most exciting news. Uh, but I I love how it came to be. So if you could share that story. Um, <laughs> and, and mostly like, why were you hesitant to do it? And then what made you decide to do it? Yeah. We recently moved from a condo that was not a pet friendly community into a, you know, a house where we now live in a community that does allow small pets. And I was really happy in my condo and I didn't really want to move but my husband had reasons and they were valid reasons. So I, I said, well, okay, but there's gotta be something in it for me. And I made him promise that if I moved, he would get me a puppy. So uh, that's, um, that's what's happening tomorrow. I'm getting my new puppy tomorrow. And uh, it's going to, first of all, bring chaos to my life. Uh, <laughs> And I've got to be a little crazy to do this. And I started second guessing myself for a little while thinking, am I crazy? I've got Parkinson's. What if I, you know, in the next five or so years can't take care of a puppy? Um, but then I th also thought, while I'm able, I will give that puppy all my love. I will raise her properly. She'll be a good little dog and she'll be happy and I'll be happy. And so my advice to people is don't, um, don't not do something because of what might happen. Don't worry about what hasn't happened yet. You know, look for things that make you happy now. Like I said, you know, uh, find your happy and make it happen. So uh, for me right now, I don't know why, I guess, there's still, you know, the, the maternal instinct comes through once in a while. I just feel the need to um, mother something, to take care of something. And that's obviously fulfilling some inner need of mine. And so I had to listen to that voice. And this voice said, do it. This voice said, you're crazy. Yeah. You know? But it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And um, it all it's all part of doing something that lift our spirits because without that um you know life is not so great right so along those lines what would you say are the silver linings that um have come with parkinson's for you i think the be the thing that i come away with as a blessing is the fact that parkinson's basically opened my mind and heart to a community of people that i consider my heroes because I see people out there who struggle with walking and talking and but they're still out there they're still living their life and um, so I look up to that that's great uh, what are well actually I'm not even gonna ask you that last question because I feel like we've already addressed it um you've shared so many great things with everybody um for those of you in the audience that are watching does anybody have a question for Edie that you want me to ask and if so I just put it in the chat you can just click uh, all all panelists and I can read that and I can ask Edie um thank you guys for being here um, Edie's little dog, she showed me a picture of it and it is, oh my gosh, it's like, would you say it's two and a half pounds or something like that? <laughs> like, how is that alive? It's so cute. So cute. Can't wait to see it. And actually Edie was supposed to pick up the dog today and um, this was scheduled. So she actually is not going to get him to her till tomorrow. So we're so grateful that you came. Thanks. While we're waiting for questions, there was one other comment I wanted to make. Um, as far as the aspects of my life that are most important and what I would, you know, which ones, if they were missing, would affect my quality of life the most. And most people think, you know, I'm a 
advocate for um, being proactive and exercising and that sort of thing. But to be very honest, it's my spirituality that is the most important part of my life because without a relationship with my creator, uh, my life has no meaning. And without hope for the future and for things to get better, the other things don't matter. So, um, and for me anyway, that's, uh -huh. that's an important thing that I have to keep doing. Absolutely. Um, Garrett asks, have you had DBS? No. Have you ever considered I, I have a tremor. That's the most difficult part of my symptom to actually control. Some days it's fine. Some days it flops around like a fish out of water. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most like part, it's, uh, is it, does it get a lot worse when you're stressed? Uh, I know you've been through a lot recently. You're just, you've been moving and this and that. Yeah. Have your symptoms, physical symptoms been, or motor symptoms been worse? A little bit. Um, you know, I still have pretty good, I have very good balance as a matter of fact, which was actually the first um, symptom I noticed other than the twitch because I was falling and, you know, tripping and, you know, my, something wasn't right. But now um, my balance, because I really focus on that a lot when I work out, uh, is much, much better. That's great. Any other questions before we um, say goodbye? We're almost at the top of the hour. Three, two, one. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us, Edie. Like I said, everybody, I'm going to send you the recording. I will send you the template so that you can do these goal worksheets, hopefully. And um, if you're feeling like it's tough to get out of bed or tough to get up out of the chair and do something, fill one of these goal sheets out, find a neighbor or a family member or a friend to do it with and um, see if you can just, you know, try something for a week and then try something for another week, uh, but just keep moving forward. Thank you, Edie, so much for being here and thanks everybody else. Thanks. I have one more thing. Can I say oh, one good. more yeah. yeah. Okay. I would like to share with the group this. I have four things that I think are important and I've written it down. And it's the word hope. The first part is never lose your sense of humor. The second part, the O is be optimistic. P is for, you know, don't underestimate the power of prayer. And E, I had to put in the exercise because you really got to get out there and move. And it will really make a difference as far as living well with Parkinson. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you, Edie. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone.